and, and what, one sort of the big projects of scientists is that scientists want to make things more homogeneous. So they want to separate out the stuff. If you go up to, to Cripple Creek, right, and you go to the, the, the mine, um, what do they want to get out of the Cripple Creek mine? Gold. So their goal is to find the gold there. Well, there's this huge mountain. I think top drawer, I, I mean, like, how many pairs? Lots of pairs, or? Yeah, I don't know. Um, is that, that's a heterogeneous, there's just, it's just a big mountain they're digging up, right? Anybody been up there? You know what I'm talking about? They just got this big, the big pile of dirt, basically, and rocks and junk, and they have to extract out of there the gold, right? And so how do they do that? Well, they have to come up with a process to get rid of the stuff that doesn't matter, the dirt and the junk that's like, well, we don't need this. How do I get it into um, a pure form of gold so I can sell it for $800 an ounce or whatever the price is these days? It's very high these days. So um, that's a problem. And so um, one big job of chemists is to figure out what's the process to separate that mixture out so that I can get the good stuff out, the gold, in that particular instance. How do I get it out um, so I can make it economical? And is it worth it? I mean, because, you know, actually there's more gold in the oceans than uh, is imaginable. But the problem is, of course, extracting it from it costs more than the gold's worth. We know how to get it. I can go grab a, five gallons of seawater, and um, you can take that, and you can extract the gold out of there. Problem is, it costs a lot more money than it's worth, because you don't only get just, you know, I don't know how what the, you know, five gallons wouldn't produce, but just a teensy-weensy bit of gold. But there's gold in that water but it's not economical to get it out. So, because the world is all kind of, it's all mixed up. Actually, there you kind of have a homogeneous mixture, but it's in a very small, but it's in such a small concentration to get it out is um, just just too expensive. All right, separation. How do we separate mixtures, as, you, as I kind of said there? So it's still here. How do you separate a mixture? You have to use what we call a physical means. So this is that... Uh, the gold guy has to figure out a way, um, the gold chemists, basically the chemists who were working there and have figured this process out up, uh, up in Cripple Creek at the mine, they figured out how to extract this stuff from the dirt. It's not like in the old days where they could just see it and grab it. It's all kind of just mixed in the dirt. And then they have a process, and it's a chemical, physical process from which they separate it out. Of course, they want to take rocks that have a higher concentration of gold, so they dig around for it. But sometimes they just, just take all this dirt, put it in the vat, go through this process. Once it's done through the process, you get gold. So they can add chemicals. So physically, what do we mean by physical properties? Okay. Uh, what is a physical property? Think of a physical change. Yeah, you have texture, yeah. But when you think of physical, when you change something physical, you don't change what it is. You just utilize its physical properties. So, for example, what would be a good physical property? Huh? No, rusting is a chemical thing. Color. Yeah, color. Okay, good. But actually, think of things that are typically more measurable. Not, not weight, but there's something like weight. No, not mass. Density. Good. Actually, this is one of the huge ways that, they, that miners or people who work in mines, um, will separate mixtures. Some things are more dense than others. And so they will actually have these slurries. They'll add water to the dirt. Some things float. Sometimes you want the things that float, and sometimes you want the things that sink. Depends on what you're after. If you want the stuff that float, they just skim it off the top, and then they, they do more processes on that, and then they throw the stuff that sinks to the bottom. Sometimes you want the stuff that sinks, the stuff that floats and or dissolves, they wash away. They're done with it. Sometimes they want the things that dissolve. So another important one is solubility. Like that's actually the gold thing. It's gold something. It's actually not. It's not just chunks of gold. It's actually a compound of gold, and they they, they can use solubility. And then they add a chemical, cyanide, some kind of a cyanide, sodium cyanide. And they extract it, and then they do another process. It's quite a big process to get that gold out. That'd be fun to go up there and kind of see them do that process. Other things like boiling point. Okay. So if I have a mixture of uh, two different liquids, and one has a high boiling point, and one has a low boiling point, if I heat it up, what's going to happen? What's going to boil first? 
the low boiling point chemical, right? And then so if you can collect the gas, which is the low boiling point chemical, you can purify it. You can get you get the low boiling point chemical first. Okay? In fact, that leads us to this uh, next uh, bullet point or distillation. Distillation is pretty cool. You've got a picture right there. That's that's usually this concept of the boiling point. This picture right here, right? And it kind of looks like this. And then uh, another flask like down like that. I didn't draw that very well. But if I have two liquids, let's say one boils at 100 degrees water, and then one boils at say 58 degrees. What happens is that the 58 degree stuff goes over here, and of course it's going to cool, and it'll be it'll recondense, and you will have a pure form of the lower boiling point chemical. In fact, the example I'm using right here, I don't know if you realize this, 58 degrees is the boiling point of C2H5OH. You may know what that is. This is alcohol, ethanol, the chemical that you know is in beer and wine. Okay. Problem is, is that how, how, you know, how do they make um, hard liquor? Remember the old days of the moonshiners? You ever re read about that in your American history class or whatever? What was what's up with that? They had this uh, thing in the 1920s, I believe it was, called Prohibition, right? What happened in Prohibition? They banned what? All alcohol. You couldn't sell alcohol in America, right? Couldn't do it. So in the in the back 40, what what did uh, Uncle Ernie do or whatever? He had a, what they call that thing in the back? They called it a still, didn't they? He had a still back in his property, right? A still comes from the word distill. So what they would do is they would take the alcohol and they would boil it. Thank you very much. You are more than welcome. They would take the uh, alcohol, they would boil it. or the, 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 the Actually, let's back up. How do they make a, um, an alcoholic beverage, wine or beer? You know, they ferment it. Good. So they have, they have sugar water. Okay, they have sugar water, and it's going to have other things in there. But just for the sake of argument, like take take a wine. They have grapes, right? Grapes have sugar in them, right? You ever had a grape? It tastes sweet, doesn't it? So what do they? What do they? What else goes into the wine when they're making the wine? Well, biological thing. Yeast. These little critters called yeast. You stick yeast in sugar water or grape juice and you let it sit for a time. The yeast are little animals. Cri I mean, some kind of a, yeah, there's some kind of little critter. You biology people know better. And they eat the sugar. And what is their waste product? Alcohol. So their waste product is alcohol. That's right. And so what happens is, of course, the as time goes on, their waste product, which is the alcohol, builds up to a higher percentage, 1%, 2%. But then here's the bugger. When it gets to 5% or 6%, I don't know the exact number, they die because, well, they're kind of sitting in their own waste and it kills them. You can't survive. They can't survive that high of a content of alcohol. It kills them. So the highest you can ever make some kind of an alcoholic beverage it's like 5 or 6% alcohol. Are there alcoholic beverages that are higher in percentage than 5 or 6%? Yeah. Surely there are, right? That's where you get the hard liquor. How, how do they get the hard liquor? Well, that's how they get it, with a distiller. They heat it up. They heat up the stuff, right? And what comes off is the pure alcohol, and the water stays behind. And if they heat it up long enough, they'll bring a little bit of the water with it, and then they'll add other flavors, you know, to get the, you know, I don't know, the different, I don't drink alcohol, so it's vodkas and the Everclears and all those kinds of things that people drink and whatever, okay? So it's a mixture. It's just basically using the concept of boiling point. One has a lower boiling point than next. Another classic example that's very important in our world today is, um, it's called fractional distillation. You have these columns that are probably 10 stories tall, and at the bottom, they put what's called crude oil. Okay? We get this from the Middle East. Big debate in this presidential candidate deal going, right? What are we going to do about energy? I can't, that's all I can see if I turn on the TV, watch the Olympics. And what is crude oil? They sell it by the barrel. It's $120 a barrel today, or whatever the heck it is, right? Uh, crude oil. Crude oil is a mixture of many, many different chemicals. And some of them has very low boiling points, 
And so actually what they do is they have uh, pipes that come off of it at different heights. And again, this is like could be as high as 10 stories tall. The ones that have the lowest boiling point come off to the all, go all to the top. And then the ones at the bottom, uh, they never boil. They, they have uh, high boiling points. This is uh, the, the low boiling points are things like propane that you use uh, in, uh, some of you may use to heat your house, but I use it on my grill, right? That kind of a thing. Uh, right here you have octane. Octane is uh, for gasoline. That's the stuff that's in your car. And down here, the stuff that doesn't boil and they kind of scrape off the bottom, that's the tar they put on the roads. And that tar, of course, you don't want it to just evaporate, right? You want it to kind of stay solid. It's, you, but you've seen, you've seen them put tar on the roads. They did a bunch of projects here this summer, right, doing road work and whatnot. And they take it, it they, they heat it up, right, and it stinks a lot, right? And then they, and then they put it on the road, and then it, it solidifies. So they heat it up to its melting point, and it's that tar. So out of a barrel of crude oil, they get lots of different products. They get uh, low boiling point things, and they get high boiling point things, and everything in between. And this is the octane. This is your gasoline. And they just have these columns and they do these pipes. And this, this goes, you know, to another pipe that then, you know, goes to a truck and the truck sends it to um, your local um, gas station. But some of the stuff goes to other things. One of the other interesting things, they, they usually get too many high, or, um, low boiling point things. And so then they have another process. It's a chemical process where they call it cracking. What they do is they take the products and then they, they join them together and they take the low boiling point ones and they make some more octane because there's a bigger market for octane than there is for propane because we drive cars a lot more than we use propane gas. So, Okay, um, chromatography. I think last year, if you recall, we did chromatography. Uh, one of our first take-home experiments, you know, what you would do is you take a, uh, um, if you have a, a, a solution here, what's a solution, by the way? Let's chat about that. What does that mean? What's a solution? In a solution, you have a two parts of a solution, solute and solvent. So the solute is what you're dissolved in. So um, a, can, a, a can of pop, the solvent is what? Water, good. And the solute is lots of solutes, actually. Sugar, carbon dioxide, etc. The solute is what get dissolved into. The solvent is what you dissolve. I didn't say that right. The solvent is what you dissolve into. The solute is what's dissolved. Okay. Um, but if I have a particular solution and I want to have, um, and it could be, it also could be two liquids, like well, alcohol and water. All right. Okay. I don't know why I'm on that tra train. Um, if you then take a piece of paper and they have special paper, some of it will travel up the paper more than the the other. And if you look at the picture on the bottom of page two. It's not very, I mean, it's black and white, but those actually have colors, and you can actually separate them based upon how far they travel in the paper. It actually has to do with how attracted it is to the paper or not. If it's really attracted to the paper, it only travels a small distance, and if it's attracted um, not very much, it will travel farther. And then they can actually measure the distances of, of their travel, and they can identify what chemicals are in there. It's kind of one of those CSI kind of things. If I have a chemical, they have uh, paper, they have that kind of chromatography, they actually have gas chrom chrom chromatographs where they can identify a particular chemical based upon what's in there. So if I have a mystery chemical found at the crime scene, I can figure out, well, I can figure out what it is. Okay? So that's just kind of some that jog in your brains on what we've been what you learned last year. Like, oh, yeah, solvents, so I get this stuff. All right. Sig figs. I think we talked about this. Just, it looks like you got that, but let's just do a real quick review of sig figs. Um... Actually, let me say one thing about sig figs, where we say why sig figs. First of all, on the AP chemistry test, and it's hard to think about that right now because it's a long ways away, right? But um, on the AP chemistry test, I like to think that you, the, the big rule is that you want to have three sig figs. Why is that? Actually, the rule is, is if you make a mistake on, on a, math, a mathematical problem on the AP chemistry test, if you are off a significant figure error, and if you are off by one significant figure, that's okay. So let's say that the correct answer um, is, you know, 2.07 grams, but you write 2.072 grams. You are technically incorrect. You are off by one sig fig. You've put four sig figs when, say, the correct answer is three.